talk about Hopfield Networks and kind of frame a lot of the kind of initial key points that you see when you're working with Hopfield Networks. This was something that, that John Hopfield tried to fig figure out, both looking at what did I see in neuroscience, and particularly many people will notice this has a really interesting connection to hippocampus and some of the hippocampal structures. Um, it is connected to certain physics optimization problems um, in terms of looking at rotating magnets. There's a number of pieces that are involved here. And so it's important to kind of start thinking about what could, ha what could we see with this. And certainly, you know, the initial sort of work started in 1981, just kept becoming very, very important pretty much the entire time John Hopfield was at Caltech. And so well, this is a really interesting direction, and you say, well, okay, I can imagine this having a vector of inputs, having a weight one, but what really distinguishes it, so I get that vector matrix multiplication, but as a combination of this, is that I have another element with the outputs going back into another vector matrix multiplication. Maybe there are also being some offsets in there, but this becomes the foundational discussion of talking about dynamics that happened just as a result of this. I've got a certain amount of not just feed forward X going into Y as a simple vector matrix multiplication, but something is also being kept of the previous history. And so the dynamics here become really important in these kinds of networks. And these were developed at a time when a lot of the neural network field had been kind of on ice uh, for some time and starting to rethink how do we begin to look at these networks and how do we start looking at the dynamics of these networks. And so you can talk about a network, let's say if it just had W and no offset, I would end up getting this sort of differential equation where I'm getting this intermediate variable V. Um, and I think of it more of a low pass filter, not just as a straight integration. And then that's actually going to be related to this sort of, if you want to say vector matrix multiplication, that is the output. So it's a very much of a heavy feedback structure. I do have sigmoids at the output here. Sigmoids would look very, very much the structure. It's like a hyperbolic tanch type of function. These typically go from zero to one in most of the Hopfield networks. Sometimes they go from minus one to plus one. All depends on the network you're building and the kinds of functions you're trying to put together. Um, this is really discussed about, you know, in terms of an average neuron firing rate, uh, where you sort of talk about up until a certain level, nothing goes, and then it has a linear increase. And at some point, it just gets tired and stops. And, but it gave me a very good analytic function. It's really interesting to see what this did, both for the Hopfield network concepts, because I wanted something continuous so everything would be analytic. But this same function then turned out to be very useful for other neural networks to give sort of a continuous um, behavior and dynamics that solved a whole range of problems. Now I can look at this for just the Y, I can look at it for having an offset, I can look at having both of them together as well as an offset. All of these things fit together pretty well. Now a couple things happen along the way. One of which is I now need to ask what's going to happen to these dynamics. And what you st one of the ways to think about this is that what this is actually demonstrating is that there is some sort of energy surface, some sort of cost function surface. You know, you might call it an energy surface. You might go, that's a bit limiting in terms of what that functionally means. There are debates. I'm not going to get way deep into that other than if you don't like energy surface, call it a cost function and we're good. Um, there's different ways to look at this, but you would argue that this is optimizing sort of a surface in Y, where Y, T, W, Y, giving me, this is a scalar term. You could do it with the offset as well. But if I do that, I'm creating sort of a surface. And remember that there's a V and a Y, so that nonlinearity that makes us a little bit messier than you would have thought. And what that means is if I look at the cost function as a function of, you know, basically position along one axis. I may very well find this kind of a surface where I might start with a whole range of initial conditions. You know, they could start right here and it's going to fall down into that wonderful sort of global minima and I get a wonderful result. It could be over here and it'll fall into that. But if I happen to start over here, it's going to fall and kind of get stuck in this local minima and stop. 
Now that could be considered a concern. It could be a sense of saying, I have many different places I could end up. There's many different memories. Maybe if as long as I'm close enough to one of them, it's going to kind of converge to that close pattern. That's really useful because you can imagine making a very large hot field network of an image and if it's close enough, it basically gets rid of noise in the image. Many different ways to think about that. And I could actually create a whole bunch of sort of fixed patterns. Say I want to store various fixed patterns where I want them to converge to so that maybe one is Y1, one is Y2, one is Y3, and they keep going. There's sort of a straightforward rule to kind of set up these attractors. Attractors meaning where is the bottom of the energy surface? Where is it going to go? This is sort of a classic rule for setting up the weights. And it turns out that as long as I have, you know, about, you know, as long as, long as the number of patterns I want to store is about 0.15 times the number of nodes, it works pretty well, at least empirically, over many decades of playing with this. So that tends to be fairly, fairly useful. And the energy surface you have looks like a quadratic, but remember that there's a nonlinearity between Y and V, so that makes your energy surface a little more fun. But this is generally where it starts. And you definitely see something along the lines of that, you know, your DV, remember that's what you're actually using. DV is something along the lines of the gradient of this energy surface. Okay, so it gives you a way to approach this. Another thing that shows up though is I can also create energy surfaces directly. And sometimes those energy surfaces could be the result of an optimization problem. And that now allows me to think about this in another case of saying, could I set this up as an optimization problem where I could eventually find a global minimum? And that might be important. For example, the traveling salesman problem is a classic one that Hopfield talked about in, in 1985. There's a whole number of other kinds of problems and discussions. But what you find is that this gives you this interesting dynamic. This really begins to make it clear what we talk about of the optimization and the cost functions that I'm optimizing for. And this sort of these, all these pieces of intuition turn out to be important for this network, but also for a whole range of things that you build past these networks.